to our uh, special first Sunday evening of the month service of Abide. We're abiding deeper into the Word of God, and tonight we're going to focus on two parts in this evening's teaching. The first part, I'm going to focus on a specific doctrinal area, and we're going to talk about the doctrine of the Bible tonight. And then in the second part, I'm going to take a section of the Scriptures and sort of summarize it, and we'll take a look at the first five books of the Bible, sometimes called the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. So that'll be in the second half after we take a very brief break. I'm very pleased that so many of you had showed up here on a Sunday evening where they're playing the Super Bowl. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I know you may have left the game early, or you didn't care about it at all, or something like that. It always reminds me of the time, and you made me heard, made, you've heard me say this story before, because I always say it whenever I have a church service on a significant sporting event. Uh, years ago, when I lived in Germany, uh, I was preaching at the church connected with the Bible college that I was a director at. I wasn't the pastor of the church, but I would occasionally preach. And one Sunday, I preached in the morning, and I was supposed to preach at the evening. And that evening, it was during the time when they were having the World Cup soccer tournament. And let me tell you, even if you're not into soccer, the World Cup is an amazing event if you're living in Europe, especially if you're living in the country that's hosting the World Cup. I mean, it's really a tremendous event. And, and so we, we were caught up in it just like anybody, but it was Sunday night service. Now, Germany was playing that Sunday night. <laughs> and not only that, they were playing England. And if you know anything, there's a huge soccer rivalry between the English and the Germans. And it's really hilarious because the English always choke. They always get their hopes up. This year we're going to do it. This year we're going to And they choke Every single time they play the Germans in one of these big tournaments. And so, but it was going to be Germany against England that night. And I'm wondering who's going to show up, you know. So I'm there. I'm ready to go. And there's a few people. I think there's a little more here tonight than there were that night in Germany there. But I, I'm getting there ready to preach. And then now uh, they had on the thing just a set up very much like this. And just over to my right there, there's a monitor that the worship singers used to look at for their words. They would just put on a little monitor. And as, as I begin preaching, I glance over there and they've got the game playing on the monitor because they were watching it back at the sound booth uh, and, and it was on the same video feed. And I, I'm like, come on now. Yeah. And so I don't know if they just switched it off here and they were still watching it back there, but I always remember that catching it out of the corner of my eye and playing that much. That's it. They're not watching it back there. Okay. All right. Good. It wouldn't matter to me if they were. But I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank everybody who's joining us on uh, online right now, because I know at least some people are. I put out on my Twitter feed right before I came, I said, look, it looks like this game's going to be a blowout anyway. You may as well just come on over and tune in to the, uh, the thing at Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara. But then for those who will catch this study later uh, on, you know, from the online ministry that we have at Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara. I'm very grateful for all of that. And tonight we're looking at something very significant significant and very important, that is the doctrine of the Bible. And, and, and when I thought about how I want to present that to you here tonight in 40 or 45 minutes, I thought, where do I begin? How do I know what to cover? It's such a huge subject. So I decided I'm going to cover it by talking about five specific things. And if I could remind you, if you have questions here tonight, either you're here, if you're watching this online, text those questions to the number you see on the screen, 805-448-7809. Text questions, and we'll kind of address those questions at the end tonight. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about five characteristics of the scriptures, the Bible. Here are the five characteristics. Authority, clarity, necessity, sufficiency, and truthfulness. Now, I'm going to go through the list at all because each one of those qualities I'm going to associate with a question. Authority, the question is, how do we know that the Bible is the Word of God? With clarity, I'm going to answer the question, can only Bible scholars understand the Bible rightly? With necessity, I want to deal with the question, how much can we know about God apart from the Bible? Do we really need the Bible to know God? 
Number four, when we talk about sufficiency, is the Bible enough for us to know what God wants us to think or to do? And then finally, truthfulness. Does the Bible tell the truth? Is it without error? Is it, to use a word, inerrant? So we're just going to talk about those five things in our first session here tonight. First of all, authority. How do we know that the Bible is God's word? Now, when we talk about the authority of the scripture, what we mean is that all the words are the Bible, excuse me, all the words of the Bible are God's words in such a way that to disbelieve or to disobey any word of the Bible is to disbelieve or disobey God. You're not just going against a book, so to speak. You're going against God because this is God's word. That's the idea of it. Now, you have to admit, that's a pretty heavy claim to attribute to any book. We fully admit that is an extreme thing to say, to say that the words of this book are in fact the words of God and they have the authority of God behind them. It is a big claim. Now, what I want you to understand, first of all, is that this is what the Bible claims for itself. Repeatedly in the Old Testament, God says that he spoke through his prophets, his messengers, in other words, there were times when his words became their words. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 is an example of this. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Whose words? God's words. Now, I have to... Uh, do two things here. I have to invite you to further study on your own, and I have to ask you to trust me at least a little bit that this is just one of many similar passages. It's not like there's just one obscure place in the prophet Jeremiah where this idea is expressed. No, this is a common thought in the Old Testament. You could go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, starting at verse 18. You could go to Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 7. You could go to 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 18. We could go again and again to these different places. But just to say this, this is a common thing where God tells us in the Bible, these are my words. Now, there are also many New Testament passages that tell us that the Old Testament writings are considered God's word. For example, we see in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness. How much scripture? All scripture. Now, it's interesting, when Paul wrote that in 2 Timothy 3.16, what scripture did he have in mind? The Old Testament, certainly, there's no doubt at all about that, the Old Testament. So this is the New Testament calling the Old Testament God-inspired, God-breathed scripture. But I want you to know something. I'm not going to take the time to develop the case here this evening. But, but I believe that Paul specifically chose his words in this context to not only include the Old Testament, which obviously includes the Old Testament. Paul was aware that Scripture was being produced in his day. And he chose the phrasing, all Scripture, to include that as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but I just want you to understand. Yes, he obviously means the Old Testament here, but I wouldn't restrict what he has to say here to the Old Testament. Again, you could see 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. I'll show you one other verse here. Matthew chapter 19, verse 45 is a very interesting case. Again, we're talking about the old the New Testament, speaking of the Old Testament as being the Word of God. Look at this. This is Jesus speaking, Matthew chapter 19, beginning at verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read? 
that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Okay, we understand what Jesus is saying there. But notice how he phrases it here in verse four. Take a look again at verse four. Have you not read that he who made them? Now, stop right here. Who was he who made them? That was God. It wasn't Moses, was it? Did Moses make Adam? No, it was God. He who made them said, uh, he who made them at the beginning, and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father. Now, if you were to go back to uh, Genesis chapter Let me just give you the reference here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, you'll see that the way that is phrased in Genesis chapter 2, it's not the words of God. It's Moses' comment on what God said. So what Jesus is telling us is that the words of Moses, the author of Genesis, were the words of God. The creator said those words through the author of Genesis. I think that's fascinating. Now, the Old Testament clearly claims to be the word of God. What about the New Testament? Does it make a similar claim? Yes, it does. The New Testament writings are also referred to as scripture. Now, You you and I may hear that word scripture and think it's not a big deal. For a first century Jew, that word scripture was only applied to God's word. You didn't use that word to refer to other holy writings or the writings of the rabbis or the opinions of the scholars or Bible commentaries. Scripture was a word reserved for the word of God itself among first century Jews. So notice what it says here in 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 15 and 16. He says, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him. This is fascinating. Peter's talking about Paul's writings. Has written to you as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand. Pause right there. Are you encouraged by the fact that Peter said that sometimes Paul was hard to understand? (laughs) That's encouraging, isn't it? Don't be too hard on yourself if sometimes you have a hard time understanding the Bible. But notice this. He says, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Do you see what Peter's saying there? He is including the writings of Paul as being among the scriptures. That is a very heavy thing for Peter to say. What I'm just trying to get at is they recognized, even in the first century, that the apostles and prophets were producing scripture. I'll give you one other example of this. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. For the scripture says, this is Paul writing, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. You say, okay, where do we find that? I think you find that particular one in Deuteronomy. Notice this. And, and, in other words, this is another saying of scripture, the laborer is worthy of his wages. Well, where's that? You start thumbing through your Old Testament. Where's that? You know what? It's nowhere in the Old Testament. You know where you find it? In Luke. This is something that Jesus said. Luke chapter 10, verse 7. Jesus is the one who said, the laborer is worthy of his wages. And Paul quotes that, quotes Luke, and calls it what? Scripture. God's holy word. And again, you could have other examples. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. 
The Bible calls itself scripture. They were aware of it in the Old Testament. They were aware of it in the New Testament. New Testament. They were bringing us the word of God. Now, there is an objection that is sometimes raised here. The objection is this. Doesn't the Bible sometimes say, now I'm speaking for the Lord, now I'm not? Didn't Paul say that once? Here, th this is the verse people are talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Now, to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Okay, Paul's saying right here, this is the Lord's command. A wife is to not depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. Okay, Paul's saying there in verses 10 and 11, that's what the Lord said. Now look at verse 12. This is where the objection comes up. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if a brother has a wife who does not believe and she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. Now, I, I got to be honest, there's people that, aha, they say. Sometimes Paul was writing on behalf of the Lord, and sometimes Paul was just given his own opinion that wasn't from the Lord. And you know what our job is to do now? Our job is just to go through the writings of Paul, or Matthew, or Mark, or Luke, or John, or Peter, or James, and decide what we think was from the Lord and what was just their own opinion. We just go through and decide what we're going to obey and believe and what we're not going to obey and believe. Now, friends, that's putting the shoe on the wrong foot. And may I say, that is not what Paul meant at all right here. Take a look at this again. When Paul refers to the Lord in verse 10 and in verse 12, he's not talking about God in a general sense. Specifically, he's talking about Jesus Christ. And this is what he's saying. He's saying something like this. Here's a situation. This is what he's saying in verse 12. Here's a situation that Jesus didn't talk about. Jesus spoke of a Jewish person married to a Jewish person in passages like Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. Here I, Paul, will by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit address what a believer should do when they're married to an unbeliever. In other words, we have recorded in the Gospels Jesus specifically talking to the issue presented in verses 10 and 11. But Jesus, the Lord, did not specifically address the issue in verse 12. Paul says, I will do it now by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So when he says, I, not the Lord, he's just letting us know Jesus did not speak specifically about the material in verse 12. I'm going to tell you about it now. Matter of fact, this simple acknowledgement is evident in Paul's words at the end of chapter 7. If you take a look at the very end of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 40, Paul says, I think that I have the, the Spirit of God in this as well. In other words, Paul recognized that he was speaking by the Spirit of God. But in verse 12, he's just simply addressing something that Jesus did not address in his earthly ministry. No, friends, we are not given either the right or the responsibility to go through this book and decide what's from God and what's not. By the way, if that is our right or responsibility, who's really in charge of this book? God or me? I mean, I am. I just go through and decide what it is. And if there's something particularly tough that I don't want to deal with, nah, that was just Paul's opinion. I, I mean, it's kind of convenient, isn't it? But doesn't that put me higher than God's word? Of course it does. Here's the issue. The Bible, God's word, has authority. Therefore, to reject, to deny, or to disobey any word of God is to reject, deny, or disobey God. I find it fascinating in Luke chapter 24, verse 25, that Jesus specifically rebuked his disciples for not believing the word of God. He said this, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. 
He rebuked them for not believing the Bible. Jesus expected his disciples to keep the word that would come through the apostles. And Paul knew that the word of the apostles should be obeyed, that they brought the commandment of the Lord, Peter says. So we have confidence in the authority of the scriptures. Now, let's talk about the second point, the clarity of the scriptures. Somebody might say, well, okay, I'll agree that the scriptures have authority if you could ever figure them out. And if you can't figure out what they say, what good is the authority of the scriptures? No, we believe in a second principle, the principle of clarity. Can I throw a theological, theological word on you? It's a word I sometimes have trouble pronouncing, so please don't mock me if I can't pronounce this. Their perspicuity of the word of God. That's like the theological term. It means clarity. The clarity of God's word. We believe that the Bible is clear. Or may I say this? It's clear enough. We're not trying to say that every verse of the Bible is perfectly easy to understand and there could never be a misunderstanding of the Bible and it's so clear that everybody understands it all alike. We're not trying to say that, but we're saying that the Bible is clear enough for us to understand and to grow thereby. We see this in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. We see this. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Well, what does that tell us about the word of God? It's understandable enough for you to explain to your children, for you to talk about in normal conversation. And let me say something. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, when these words were spoken, was Moses, or should I say the Lord through Moses, was Moses speaking only to a bunch of Bible scholars? No, this is to the common people of Israel, who I would say were less literate and educated than the average person in the world today. But the thought is, you can understand this. You can teach your children this. It's for us all. It's also seen in the New Testament. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verses 12, uh, verses 3, 4, and 5. It says this, But he said to them, this is Jesus, but Jesus said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, not for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? There's a theological controversy. And Jesus brings up here the example of David in the book of 1 Samuel. And what I love is how Jesus brings this up. And he, he just expects that they would understand it. Jesus never blamed people's confusion or misunderstanding of the Bible on a lack of clarity in the Bible. In other words, you never find Jesus saying something like this. <laughs> Man, there's so many interpretations. Who can know what to believe? <laughs> Jesus never says anything remotely like that about the Bible. No, Jesus spoke of the scriptures with the assumption that they could be believed. I'll give you a further evidence of this. These letters in the New Testament, Paul's letters to the churches, uh, Peter's letters, James' letters, the letter of Hebrews, to whom were they written? W were they written to theological schools? Were they written to seminaries? They were written to congregations. To congregations filled with people just like us. Maybe some more educated, maybe some less educated, many of them slaves. But the idea is this can be written to a congregation and what? They can understand it. It's never ever written with the idea that they wouldn't be able to understand it. The writers of the New Testament expected that their readers, now by the way, when Paul and Peter and James and such wrote to the churches, they wrote understanding that many of their readers would be Gentiles. Did they not? This was no mystery to Paul, for example, or to Peter. Yet they still wrote with reference to the Old Testament scriptures. 
In other words, they never said, oh, you'll never expect those Gentiles to understand the Old Testament. Never, never, never. Don't even bother with that. No, again, the assumption is given all the way through that the Bible is a book that can be understood. It's inherent in everything. Now, let me deal with an objection here. Here's a common objection people raise. If the Bible is so clear, why do Christians disagree about so many of the Bible's teachings? And, and can I just say, that's not a dumb question. It's a valid question. If the Bible is so clear, why isn't every Christian in perfect agreement on every uh, doctrinal thing in the Bible? Well, let, let me give, answer that in two ways. Number one, I would say that disagreement among Christians is actually exaggerated. There is wide agreement among Christians on the basics. The deity of Jesus Christ, his atoning death, his resurrection, our need for God's grace, the importance of faith, the need for us to love our neighbors, and so on. I could go on and on. You know, it's true. There are many doctrinal areas where Christians disagree. But don't ever forget that the overwhelming majority of Christians are in great agreement on the overwhelming majority of Christian doctrines. And that's really something astonishing. This even extends to Christian practice. For 2,000 years, Christians have gathered together to worship God, to pray, to hear the preaching of God's word, and to share time with other believers. Now, the manner, the order, the proportion of those things has varied and still varies to this day. But let me tell you, there is more in common among Christians throughout the centuries than there is different. So I think that the differences in Christian belief is exaggerated, but I'm not trying to pretend that they don't exist. What about the differences that do exist? Well, I would say this, and this is number two. When Christians disagree, it's for one of two reasons. Number one. It may be that we are trying to make an affirmation where the scriptures are silent. You know, that's the source of a lot of disagreement among Christians. We're, we're trying to go beyond, in something we affirm, something that the scriptures actually say. Well, no wonder there's going to be disagreement about those things. But then number two, that that's, doesn't cover everything. It may be that we have made mistakes in our interpretation of the Bible. We are fallible human beings. There is nobody, I'll say it again, nobody, one more time, nobody including people who have written a commentary on the entire Bible, there is nobody who's perfect in their biblical interpretation. It's just not now, I, I'll say, I am not, aware of any particular area where I'm wrong because if I was I would change it would I not right. if I knew I was uh, it's never a case of the case well I know I'm wrong about this doctrine but I'm gonna teach it anyway because of x y or z are you kidding why would I ever do that but I am recognizing that I am a fail fallible imperfect human being and I do not perfectly comprehend everything well, we understand, and it's the same is true of you and of everybody. We just understand that we are not perfect interpreters of the Bible. However, we are not free to say that the teaching of the Bible on any subject is confusing or incapable of being understood correctly. Now, let me make one more point before we go on to the third point. The principle of the clarity of Scripture does not mean that God does not use teachers or scholars to explain the Bible. That's part of the way that God brings clarity to the Scriptures. And so God still has a role for preachers and teachers and scholars and all the rest of it. All right, here. Number three, our third point. Necessity. How much can we know about God without the Bible? Okay. Maybe this is the word of God. Maybe it's clear for us to understand. Again, not perfectly, but in the whole, in the main. 
But maybe we don't really need it. Maybe there's lots of ways to know what God says. Maybe this is just one of many ways that God has spoken. Well, again, I would say no. The necessity of Scripture means that the Bible is necessary for knowing the gospel, for maintaining spiritual life, and for knowing God's will. Now, we would say this. The Bible is not necessary to know that God exists. The Bible is not necessary for knowing something of God's character and his moral laws. Look, the Bible makes it very clear in Romans chapter 10 that people cannot know the gospel without a preacher. And what is the preacher's source of information? It's the word of God. People need the Bible to know the love of God and specifically the gospel of what God has done for humanity in the person and work of Jesus Christ, especially in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We would not know that by looking at the glory of God's creation, even though we know something of God from the glory of his creation. We would not know that by looking at morality as it is implanted in the human conscience, even though we know something of God from conscience. But let me tell you something. By looking at creation, we can learn, we can discern that God is powerful, that God is brilliant, that God is an amazing designer. He's the ultimate designer. That God has set a system that encompasses all things and just set everything in motion powerfully, beautifully. We can see all that just from looking at creation. But you know what creation does not show us, I think, inherently? Or maybe it doesn't show us this consistently. It doesn't show us that God is love. Look, we live in the 21st century compared to the rest of human history in unspeakable comfort and protection in life, security. Unspeakable. We, and, and I'm not against this, I'm all for it. Um, I'm not going to walk home, I'm going to drive home. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not going to sleep out in my backyard. I'm going to sleep in a, you know, a soft bed in a warm home. I'm 100% for all that. But most of humanity has known creation to be harsh and brutal and deadly. We know the love of God revealed from us. The word of God is necessary to know the love of God in its fullness. Now, the Bible is not only necessary for knowing the gospel, it's also necessary for maintaining spiritual life and for having a certain knowledge of God's will. We can't rely purely on our reason. We can't rely purely on our conscience. We understand that the fall has affected every aspect of man's being. And our reason, though I will say human reason is a beautiful gift from God, it's not infallible. Our conscience is a beautiful gift from God, but it's not infallible. No, what we need is the word of God. Now, I'll say it again. The Bible is not necessary to know that God exists. So general revelation, if we want to call it that, is a blessing. But we need special revelation. We need the Bible. It is necessary. Okay, let me move on here. Number four, sufficiency. Is the Bible enough for knowing what God wants us to think or to do. Let me give you a definition of the sufficiency of the scriptures from Wayne Grudem, a great theologian. He says this, the sufficiency of scripture means that scripture contains all the words of God he intended his people to have at each stage of redemptive history. And that now it contains everything we need God to tell us for our salvation for trusting him perfectly and for obeying him perfectly. That's the sufficiency of scripture. 
The Bible tells us what we need to know for salvation. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for many different purposes in living the Christian life. But it's also not only there for helping us to know salvation, but also how to live the Christian life. Now, when we receive this truth, we can live our Christian life with the general knowledge. Did I say perfect knowledge? No, I said general knowledge. We can live our Christian life knowing generally that we're living our life pleasing to God. How? By doing what God tells us to do in this book. We obey his word, or at least we endeavor to. Now, again, never perfectly, but in a general sense, we can know what God wants us to do and how to live from this book. We don't have to look outside this book for God's general will for our life. Now, I do believe that God may guide us by the Holy Spirit apart from a specific Bible passage, but never in contradiction to what the Bible says. Do you get that difference here? Yes, he may do it in addition to the Bible, but never in contradiction to it. The Bible does, after all, speak to us about being led by the Spirit. You can find that in Romans chapter 8, verses 9, 14, and 16. Galatians chapter 5 also speaks about it. And it's also possible for the Holy Spirit to lead us through his speaking to someone else in God's family. Sometimes we call this the gift of prophecy. But let me say, these will never equal the scripture in authority and should be always tested by the Bible. By what else we know about a situation, in other words, godly wisdom, and by counsel from good and godly friends. Now, this last part, I told you that I believe that the scriptures are sufficient. They give us what we need, but that God may speak to a person and guide them spontaneously and supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that within the Christian world, there are people who strongly disagree with that. And they would say that God never speaks to anyone outside the Bible. That the only way God speaks to people is through the Bible. I would respectfully disagree with that. I would, now, I have to say, the people I know who teach that, I do respect the reason why they teach it. They want to guard the sufficiency of Scripture. And I respect that. They, they want to say, once you admit that the Holy Spirit may speak to a person apart from the Bible, then you can just start adding extra pages to your Bible. Now, I disagree with that, but again, I admire their zeal to guard the sufficiency of Scripture. But let me tell you why I have no problem making a different category for that altogether. Because in the days of the New Testament, there were definite Holy Spirit-inspired prophets and prophetic utterances, and we do not have their words in the Bible. We know in the city of Corinth that prophets functioned. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14. Where are the writings of the Corinthian prophets? They're not in here. We know from the book of Acts that Philip had four daughters who were prophetesses. Where are the writings of Philip's daughters? They don't exist. Do, do you see what that says? It says that a spontaneous prophetic utterance is not on par with what God has preserved in his word. It's just not. And so to say that if it is genuinely from the Holy Spirit, it must be on par with what is written in the Bible, it's just not true. I just don't regard that. Again, I, I, I understand why people make that argument, and I kind of respect their motivation for making it. I just don't agree with some of the premises that they make. We don't have to fear that the true gift of prophecy or God simply guiding or leading a believer will add pages to our Bible. You know, I've been thinking about this lately. I've been thinking about the, the people. And again, they're, they're dear people. 
No, God never will speak to anybody apart from the scriptures. That's what they say. I, I, I want to ask this question. Well, do you believe that the Holy Spirit convicts a person of sin? How? H how does the Holy Spirit convict somebody of sin? There must be some message that the Holy Spirit communicates to that person. Even if the message is just this, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus. Well, isn't that the Holy Spirit speaking to that person? I, I think it's just evident that God speaks to people. Now, I, I just want to say this. Not everybody who claims that God is speaking to them, God is actually speaking. We know that. But God speaks to people today, but it's never on par with what he has revealed. Okay, which brings us to number five, and the last one in this particular section. Truthfulness. Does the Bible tell the truth, and is the Bible without error? Is it inerrant? I can answer that question simply. Yes, it is inerrant. The Bible tells the truth. Titus chapter 1 verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Now, if this is the word of God, it can't lie. It tells the truth. Now, this sometimes brings up the issue of interpreting the Bible literally. Some people are horrified that they have to get the smelling salts in the fainting couch when they hear that I, or perhaps you, interpret the Bible literally. You, you don't understand the Bible literally, do you? And, and I would say for myself, the proper answer to that question is yes. How else would you ever understand it? Now, maybe they mean a different thing by literally than I mean. Here's what I mean by literally. According to its literary context. When the Bible speaks history, it's true history. When the Bible speaks poetry, it's true poetry. When it speaks prophetically, it's true prophecy. When it speaks didactically in its teaching, it's true teaching. And on and on and on. There are different genres of literature and literary expression in the Bible, but it's true in whatever it presents. So the Bible is true. Here's some verses that speak of the truthfulness of God's word. Psalm, chapter, Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. God's word is pure and true. It's been tested. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Psalm 119, verse 89. I love this verse. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. You know what I always think about when I read that verse? I think, you know, there's a lot of seminaries in the world today where God's word is not settled. There's a lot of pulpits today where God's word is not settled. There's a lot of places out on the internet where God's word is not settled. But I'll tell you one place it is settled. It's settled in heaven. It's just not changing and it doesn't need to change. Or how about this one? John chapter 17, verse 17, the words of Jesus. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. How simple, how straightforward. Now, let me tell you some things that inerrancy is not. When we say the Bible is truthful in everything it says, that it's inerrant, sometimes the best way to understand something is by understanding what it is not. Inerrancy affirms that what the Bible says about any subject is true. The Bible is not a science textbook. 
but what it does say about science is true. So we should expect that there's lots of science that the Bible never directly touches on, but whatever it does touch on is true. Now, what is errancy not? Inerrancy does not contradict the truth that the Bible speaks in the ordinary language of everyday speech. In other words, it speaks of the sun rising and other such things. Now, can you imagine saying, no, 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 the Bible's not inerrant. It says the sun rises. And you know, the sun doesn't rise. The earth rotates on its axis. And it's the earth that's moving in relation to the sun, not the sun moving in relation to the earth. How can you say the Bible? Because the Bible speaks in ordinary language of everyday speech. So that is not a contradiction to the idea of inerrancy. Number two, inerrancy also has to do with the truthfulness of its reporting, not with the degree of precision with which events are reported. This is what I mean by this. If we want to talk about, for example, distances, the Bible says something is a particular distance. Or I'll just use our example. It is about 10 miles from Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara to our house. But if you were to go out and map it out on your phone right now, you might say, well, David, it's not 10 miles. It's 9.7 miles. <laughs> and then if you want to get the, the, uh, the uh, real calibration, no, it's not 9.7. It's 9.7. 6853. You know, and you could get it down to the centimeter if you wanted to. But am I lying? Am I not being truthful when I say, well, it's 10 miles to my house? Not at all. Because there's a certain degree of precision implied in what I say and expected by the hearers. So it's not being untruthful to say it's 10 miles to my house when you could actually say, well, no, it's nine points at whatever. So again, th that has to do with the degree of precision. That has to do with all kinds of numbers and records and things that are recorded in the Bible. Inerrancy also does not exclude the use of loose or free quotations. As long as the meaning of a quotation does not change, inerrancy is not challenged by loose or free quotations. Now, this is something that is just basically different about culture in biblical days than in our day. In our days, we rightly so, we're pretty hung up on having a quotation be exact. Ancient world, it just didn't matter so much. The meaning was important. The exact words were not so. That is why sometimes you will have the same saying of Jesus recorded in slightly different words, let's say in Matthew compared to Mark. Now, admittedly, sometimes we get hung up on that. Well, which is it? That's not a matter that affects inerrancy at all. It doesn't, in the ancient world, it was just accepted that People would quote things with a looseness or freeness, but the meaning implied in the words was always true. And I'll say this, inerrancy does not exclude unusual or uncommon grammatical constructions in the Bible. Something can be a truthful report of what was said or happened and still contain unusual or grammatic constructions. Now, we don't see this in our English translations, but apparently in Greek and Hebrew manuscripts and in writings in the ancient world, spelling differed widely. They would spell the same words differently. You know, they didn't have dictionaries and lexicons and that in the same frequency. They, they existed, but they were very rare and not in common use. Therefore, the same word could be spelled different from place to place. That doesn't matter at all for inerrancy. Inerrancy is getting after the meaning of what is said and the words used to represent that meaning. Now, let me bring forth another objection. Isn't it true, some people would object, that the Bible is only authoritative for what they would call faith and practice, not in regard to historical or scientific facts? Now, I just want to say that the Bible itself does not make any restriction 
on the kinds of subjects that it speaks truthfully about. It says, every word of the Lord proves true, not just the things about faith and practice. Matter of fact, I like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He tells us that the things that happened in the Old Testament were things that actually happened. In other words, they, they happened. They're not just stories. The things that are recorded in the Bible are true. Now, there's another objection that sometimes people raise. They say, aren't you afraid that some new fact might come up and contradict the Bible? And I say, no, I'm not afraid of that. Now, I, I, I'll allow that at least theoretically it could be true. Theoretically. But I don't believe it would ever happen. And I'll tell you why. Because the Bible is more certain than even the most reliable things that we know. Um, people are pretty sure about the day that they're born. Um, Brett, do you know the day you were born? You can tell the day you were born. How do you know that's the right day you were born? My mom told me. Your mom told you. Uh, is it possible that your mom could be wrong? Possible. possible. It's possible. Do you got a birth certificate for that? I do. You got a birth certificate. It, it, that date of birth is on that birth certificate. It is. Is it possible that your birth certificate could be an error? It could be. I, I mean, it's happened, I suppose, hasn't it? It would be rare, but it's happened. You see, that's right. Here's the thing. I mean, even something that we are as certain about as the day we were born, there could be new knowledge that comes along to tell us, oh, that wasn't actually the day you were born. Um, actually, it, it's very complicated but you were born at 11.59 p.m. on the 3rd, not at 12.01 on the 4th. You know, or things like that. Oh, wow, actually my birthday is different than I thought. Okay, it could come out that way. But here's the thing. What we have with God is that there are not any new facts to God. New facts can come to us. Oh, I thought I was born on this day, but I found out I was really born on another day. But there are no new facts to God. What God knows, he knows from all eternity. Therefore, we can be certain about God's word in a way that goes beyond other certainty because we know the one who knows all things. I'll tell you, it's a strange way to think about it. You can be more certain about God's word than you can even be about the day you were born. Because it's impossible for a new fact to emerge that's new to God. You know the one who wrote it. All right, I want to conclude this little section. Believe me, I know I've gotten a little long in the first section. We'll go a little shorter in our second session. But I just want to talk about this. How do we come to a real confidence that the Bible is the Word of God. Look, I understand that I can say all day long that the Bible is authoritative. Uh, I can say to you that the Bible is clear, that the Bible's necessary, that the Bible's uh, uh, sufficient, that the Bible's truthful. But at the end of it all, how do we individually come to this confidence? I'll tell you how. We come to this confidence that the Bible is the word of God as the Holy Spirit works in our heart as we read and think about the words of the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that it's impossible for that to come to somebody else, to somebody a different way. Maybe there are some people who have never read a word of the Bible, but just for some reason from the get-go, they truly believe and have confidence this is God's word. Normally, this assurance comes by the Holy Spirit as we read and think about the word of God. Now, I can objectively, apart from from uh, a direct work of the Holy Spirit, apart from quoting you the Bible. I can objectively show you that the Bible is absolutely the most unique, influential, widespread, impactful book of all human history. I can show you that by uh, impartial, objective metrics. 
But I can't prove to you that it's the Word of God, apart from the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart as you read the Bible. You need to read the Bible to come to the settled conviction that it is more than simply the most unique and influential book of all of human history, that it is the Word of God. External evidences can disprove that a book is divine, like that's the case with the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon claims to be God's book. But when you take the external evidences of history and archaeology and geography and all the rest, it shreds the Book of Mormon. External evidences can disprove that something is the Word of God. But fundamentally, the persuasion that this is the Word of God comes by the Holy Spirit. As it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. This is what I want to say. Ultimately, the words of Scripture are self-attesting. Scripture is not proved to be the Word of God by a higher authority than the Word of God. In other words, if my reason proves that this is the Word of God, then my reason can say it's not the Word of God. If the archaeology proves this is the Word of God, then archaeology can disprove it. Now, again, I'm not discounting the role of our reason. I'm not discounting archaeology or history. But ultimately, if I say I'll submit to the Bible when I think it's reasonable, then the Bible is subject to my reason. It actually places my reason above the Bible. We don't place reason or historical data or archaeological data above the Bible. The Bible itself is truly our highest authority. Not because it is a magic book, but because it reliably brings to us the Word of God. Now, I know, and this will be my last statement in this first section. I know some people say, David, that's a circular argument. Well, in a sense, it's true. Yet, that this is a kind of circular argument does not make it invalid because any argument for an absolute authority must appeal back to that authority for proof. And that's what we're doing with the Bible. This is the Word of God. It is the word of God, again, in authority, in clarity, in necessity, in sufficiency, and it is the word of God in truthfulness to us. We can rely upon it. We're going to be talking about now about the books of Moses. So if you open up your Bible and take a look, of course, your Bible begins with the book of Genesis. Then the first five books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. Those are the first five books of the Bible, sometimes called the Pentateuch, uh, meaning five books. Uh, also known, it, it's kind of interesting if you take a look at the Bible in some different languages. Uh, for example, in German Bibles, they don't really call it the book of Genesis. They call it the first book of Moses, first Moses. Uh, Exodus is the second book of Moses, second Moses, and that. These are the first five books of the Bible, and they are their own unit kind of standing alone. Again, these five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Now we ask ourselves, who wrote the book of Moses, these books of Moses? Let me give you a clue. It was Moses wrote these books. Um, how do we know that Moses wrote these books? Well, first of all, the books themselves tell us that Moses wrote them. For example, Exodus chapter 17, verse 14 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Again, 
Moses, you're told to write and to put it in a book, the book that you're writing. Uh, Numbers chapter 33, verse 2 says, Now Moses wrote down the starting points of their journey at the command of the Lord, and these are their journeys according to their starting points. Again, Moses wrote. Now, it's not only claiming that Moses wrote them within these first five books of the Bible, but Moses is also understood in the New Testament to be the author of the law. We have this from the words of Jesus himself. Now, one thing you need to understand is you can call these first five books of Moses, the books of Moses, you can call them the Pentateuch, but there's also a specific terminology for them in Jewish nomenclature. You call them the Torah or the law. So when Jesus says in John chapter 7 verse 19, Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? He's not just talking about the commands. He's talking about the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books. Notice who Jesus says, Moses gave you the law. And so we find this, that Moses is the author of law, also in the second Corinthians, uh, second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. We read, But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. Now verse 15, But even this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Again, speaking of the Torah, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. Matter of fact, you will find quotations in Mark chapter 12, quoting Exodus chapter 3, and Jesus says, Moses wrote it. Uh, You'll find Jesus referring in Matthew chapter 8 verse 4 to Leviticus 14 and saying, Moses wrote it. Uh, In Romans chapter 10, you'll find Paul quoting Deuteronomy chapter 32, and he says, Moses wrote it. And we also have this additional piece of information. In Acts chapter 7, verse 22, it tells us that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Moses had the education, the ability. He could write these books. He did write these books. Now, if Moses is the author of the first five books of the Moses, uh, first five books of the Moses, first five books of the Bible, how did he write them? Well, I believe, and I can't prove this, but I think the scripture suggests this, that Moses wrote the book of Genesis through a combination of compiled records and divine revelation. Now, what do I mean by compiled records? I'll get to that in just a moment. But I would also say that Moses wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy because he was there for most of it, and the Holy Spirit directly guided him to write it. Now, what do I mean about the markers of compiled records in Genesis? There's a very interesting phrase used repeatedly in the book of Genesis. Let me show you this phrase. Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the image and likeness of God. He created the male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day that they were created. I believe that that marks the end or a transition point where Moses is no longer using Adam's record. Uh, Genesis chapter 6 verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. He really doesn't give you a genealogy of Noah. But I believe that that's where his record begins. I believe that that phrase marks a beginning or an end of what particular contributors of of the sources for the book of Genesis got to uh, Moses. Now, some people debate, did they get to him in verbal form? Did they get to him in written form? I don't know. 
Uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and they were sons born to him after the flood. Um, Genesis chapter 11, verse 10. This is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begot uh, Arphaxad two years after the flood. Uh, Genesis chapter 11, verse 27. This is the genealogy of Terah. Uh, Genesis chapter 25, verse 12. This is the genealogy of Ishmael. Uh, Genesis chapter 25, verse 19. This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. And then there's one more reference in Genesis chapter 36, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Esau. Now again, I don't think it can categorically be proven. But I think in there, at least the suggestion that there are marking points of contributions from earlier records, whether they were verbal or written, that were delivered to Moses. And he, along with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, compiled them into the book of Genesis. Because we understand the book of Genesis uh, deals with events that were long before the time of Moses. But starting in Exodus we come up to events that were in the days of Moses. Now, when I say that Moses wrote the book of the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, I don't mean that he wrote every word in them. I do believe that at least at two places there were some editorial additions. Let me give you two examples. First of all, here's what Moses didn't write in the books of Moses. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Now the man Moses was very humble more than all men who were on the face of the earth. <laughs> I, I believe that's an editorial comment. If I had to guess, Joshua wrote that. I can't prove it, but I would guess Joshua wrote that. Added that in, because I want everybody to know in the context of the story, Moses was an incredibly humble man. And by the way, that's an important fact to know in the course of that narrative in Numbers. But wouldn't it be awesome if Moses wrote that about himself? <laughs> it, it, let, let's just say, and I, I'll just get a little silly with this. You know, the Holy Spirit speaks to Moses. Say, Moses, you need to write this. And Moses says, I'm not writing that. <laughs> How can I write that? I'm the most humble man on the face. No, you write that. Okay, I don't believe Moses wrote, but if he did, it's just sort of fun to think about that. But here's something else that I can say with much more confidence that Moses did not write. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. Again, we're not trying to say that Moses, being the author of the first five books, that he absolutely wrote every single word. There may have been occasional editorial insertions, but in the main, in the whole, these are the books of Moses. Moses wrote them. Now, what is in these books? Well, let's just do a quick, and I mean quick, survey of these books. A survey of Genesis. You can divide Genesis into two parts. Four events. What are the four events in the book of Genesis? You have creation, the fall, the flood, and the dividing of the nations. That takes up something like 2,000 years, at least from creation. Look, there are Christians who debate, was creation, you know, in six days? Was it over long periods? Whatever. Uh, after creation, you're talking about approximately 2,000 years from the time Adam and Eve are in the garden to the dividing of nations, about, about 2,000 years. Then, after those first, 12, uh, first 11 chapters, I should say, dealing with four great events. What are the four great events again? Creation, the fall, the flood, and the dividing of the nations at Babel. Then you have four people that the record deals with. Now, I'm not trying to say that there's not minor characters introduced, but really the rest of the book of Genesis from chapter 12 all the way from chapter 50, it deals with four significant people. Who are those people? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, whose name was also Israel, and Joseph, one of Jacob's or Israel's sons. Isn't that a simple way to understand the book of Genesis? Four events, Four people. 2,000 years encompassing those four events. 200 years encompassing the four people. That's it. 
Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. That's the book of Genesis. Again, I believe, I can't prove it, but I believe that Moses wrote Genesis. I, I do believe that. But he wrote it having compiled records that were there before. Now you have the book of Exodus. What's a survey of Exodus? Well, from chapter 1 through chapter 18, you have the story of redemption. Where God works in and through Israel in and through Moses, I should say, to redeem Israel from their slavery in Egypt and to deliver them to the promised land. So you have Israel being multiplied in Egypt, Moses' birth and early career, Moses at the burning bush, Moses gets a commission from God, Moses has his battle with Pharaoh, God sends the plagues, uh, God announces the death of the firstborn, the Passover comes, and then finally God delivers the people of Israel from Egypt. That's their redemption. You could say that... Um, well, most of the first 18 chapters happens over a course of uh, two months. Uh, once you get to the burning bush, at least. You have the life of Moses up until that point. Then, starting at chapter 19, begins a whole new phase of not only the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, a whole new phase of the books of Moses. Because from Genesis chapter 19, all the way through the middle of the book of Numbers, they're at Mount Sinai. It all takes place at Mount Sinai. Now, the portion in Exodus encompasses about 10 months. From chapter 19 all the way through to the end of the book of Exodus, it's revelation from God. They receive the Ten Commandments. They get laws to direct the judges. They make a covenant. They get instructions on making the tabernacle and establishing the priesthood. God makes a covenant with Israel, and then they finally make the tabernacle at the end of the book of Exodus. But all what this is, is revelation from God. This is what God is telling them to do. The book of Exodus begins in Egypt, obviously. Where does it end geographically? It ends at Mount Sinai, and the entire book of Exodus encompasses about uh, 12 months. Now, next we come to the book of uh, Leviticus. Leviticus is the third book of Moses. And in that book, you could divide it again into two parts. The first part encompasses the first 17 chapters, and we would call it sacrifice. It is the system of sacrifice, the system of the priesthood, and the ceremonies associated with it. And that's really the whole bulk of the first 17 chapters of the book of Leviticus. How they're supposed to do the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the instructions for the priests, the conduct for the priest, and all that the priests were to do in their priestly service. That's basically the first 17 chapters of the book of Leviticus. Now, chapter 18, through the end of the book, you're dealing with sanctification. You have laws that God gives to the people. You have instruction on how they're supposed to celebrate the feasts of Israel. But then you have something very interesting in Leviticus chapter 26, which is going to be repeated later in Deuteronomy. You have God announcing blessings and curses upon Israel. This was an important aspect of the covenant that God made with Israel. And the covenant, an important feature of it was basically this. Israel, I make my covenant with you, and I will glorify myself through you. If you obey me, I will glorify you by blessing you so much that the world be astounded at how much you are blessed. If you disobey me, I will glorify myself to the world by afflicting you so much 
that the world would be astounded that a nation could be so afflicted and still survive. Either way, I'm going to glorify myself in you. And that dynamic of blessing or cursing, in a sense, has been the legacy of the nation of Israel, of the Jewish people, ever since. A very important part of the book of Leviticus in its second part of what God was showing in and through the book of Num uh, Leviticus. Then, uh, by the way, the book of Leviticus basically takes place over, you could say, one month. And it all takes place at Mount Sinai, the entire thing. Bringing us now to the book of Numbers. Now, the book of Numbers, again, begins at Mount Sinai. And what are they doing? Well, in the first part of the book of, of, of Numbers, they're preparing to leave Mount Sinai. And the one they want to do is make a census. They want to count the people of Israel. And they want to organize them into camps. You know, in my mind, one of the most exciting and profound themes through the book of Numbers is how God transforms Israel from a slave people to a free people. What I would call a promised land people. They were a slave people. By the way, how long were they slaves in Egypt? Some 400 years. Is that going to have an effect on people? Absolutely it will. <laughs> Especially when it was a year ago that you were a slave. You've only been out of Egypt a year. You think like a slave. You act like a slave. Your habits are like slaves. In the book of Numbers, God takes this slave people and he says... I'm going to make you a promised land, people. I I'll give you an example. Uh, slaves don't have to organize their work. Th they just do what they're told. Uh, slaves don't have a personal investment in their work. They work to survive. They work because they'll get beaten if they don't. But they, they don't care about their work. Matter of fact, they resent their work. That's not what God wants for promised land, people. So what's the first thing he does? He counts them and he organizes them. He says basically this, you guys came to Mount Sinai like a mob of slaves. You're going to leave Mount Sinai marching in ranks, organized exactly like I tell you to be organized. Because you're no longer a slave people. You're a promised land people. I think it's a beautiful and powerful theme. So that's what we find in these initial cham uh, chapters, I should say, of the book of Numbers. God getting them ready to leave uh, the uh, Mount Sinai. And, and then they do leave Mount Sinai. They leave Mount Sinai in Numbers chapter 9. They make their way out. They were at Mount Sinai a year. Then they head out and on their way from Mount Sinai, it transitions from the old generation into chapter 10 to being the tragic transition. They depart from Mount Sinai. They send spies into Canaan. The, Canaan, uh, the, the spies come back from Canaan. And their report is that the land is occupied by people who are too mighty for us. We can't do it. We should have stayed in Egypt. It sent 12 spies. 10 of the spies came back with a negative report. We can't do it. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, came back with a positive report. And they said, we can do it. God will, will enable us to do it. The people believed the 10 negative spies instead of the two positive ones. And uh, they said, no, we're not going to go in. God said, you're a generation of unbelief. You're going to die in the wilderness. Your kids will trust me and they will inherit the promised land. Wow. Wow. I still can't get over that when I think about it. God said, you as a generation, you're going to die in the wilderness all except for two people. Joshua and Caleb, they will enter into the promised land. This is what they did. 
They wandered. Not they were led by God, but God led them into wandering in the wilderness for 38 years until that generation of unbelief died. Then they could go into the promise. So, so much of the book of Numbers is that generation of unbelief dying off. They have to deal with laws. They have to deal with rebellions. They have to deal with purifications. And then finally, finally, in Numbers chapter 21, they're ready to go to Canaan again. Part two, after the generation has died off. The new generation heads to Canaan in verse 20, in chapter 21, I should say. And as they head on their way, they have victory after victory, victory over the Amorites, over Balaam and Balak, over fiery serpents, victory over Midian. And then they, they have a second census. And that encompasses just a matter of months. Again, the survey of numbers begins at Mount Sinai. It ends at the plains of Moab, ready to go into the promised land. And in between, you've got 38 years in the wilderness. Yikes. Then we have the fifth of the books of Moses, and that, of course, is the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy, again, is really kind of divided into three parts, three different sermons, you could say, that Moses gave to the people of Israel there on the plains of Moab as they're ready to go into the promised land. I mean, look, after all, the law came to them at Mount Sinai 40 years before. They needed to hear it again. They needed a reminder. So in a series of three sermons, Moses reminds them. It's kind of cool because the first sermon focuses on history. Hey, this is what God has done. I want you guys to remember what God has done. And by the way, I think that's a great lesson for any one of us. Anything that God is going to do in our lives is built on the foundation of what he has already done. So first sermon is centered on history. The second sermon from chapter 4 into chapter 26 is centered on the idea of uh, legal matters. In other words, he repeats the law to them, what God wants them to do. And he spells it out to them. Then the third sermon, starting in chapter 27, is prophetic. He talks about what God will do, and he repeats the aspect of the blessings and curses. Deuteronomy begins on the plains of Moab, and it ends on the plains of Moab. You could say that it basically takes place over one month or so. Well, that's a quick survey of the first five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But let me conclude with this. I told you that the second session would be shorter than the first one. Aren't you happy about that? I was looking for something to make a continuity between the five books of Moses. And how about this? The books of Moses begin with Adam, humanly speaking, and end with Moses. <laughs> Adam dies in the beginning of Genesis, when he sins in the garden, in the day you eat of it, you shall die. Death began in Adam there. He didn't actually die for hundreds of years later. But the, 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 the book of Genesis opens with Adam dying spiritually, and it ends with Moses dying on Mount Pisgah in the book of Deuteronomy. Begins with Adam, ends with Moses. Do you realize that both Adam and Moses are vitally connected to Jesus Christ? Check this out. Romans chapter 5 verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. Who knows who the one man is there? The one man's offense. Anybody want to guess? This is one thing, so you don't want to say Jesus. <laughs> It was Adam. Through Adam's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, 
the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, who's that? Adam, good, I'm glad nobody said Jesus. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, who's that? Jesus. Jesus. Many will be made righteous. You could say that there are two heads of the human race. Adam and Jesus. We're all born into Adam. We're born again into Jesus. And if Adam remains your head, you're in a lot of trouble. But if Jesus becomes your head, you have salvation and security in him. Adam and Jesus are vitally connected. So the first five books of Moses begin with Adam, but they end with Moses. How is Moses connected to Jesus? Check this out in Deuteronomy chapter 18, starting at verse 18. God says this, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. In other words, this second prophet that comes, the one who is like Moses, they better listen to him. This prophecy of the second prophet was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the prophet like Moses in the sense that he also is a lawgiver and a deliverer of his people. But he is also greater than Moses. Don't ever forget what it says in John chapter 1 verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See that parallelism between Moses? Now, there's no doubt who's greater, just like there's no doubt who's greater between Adam and Jesus. Can I tell you, Jesus is far greater than Adam. When Adam was tested in the garden, he failed. When Jesus was tested in the garden, he proved true. When Moses gave the law, he gave it imperfectly and did not perfectly represent God. That's why he wasn't enabled to uh, enter into the promised land. When Jesus brought God's law to us and led God's people, he did it perfectly. And he is our Joshua also who leads us into the promised land. Parallel, but there's no doubt who's greater. With all these things, we can see that not only did Moses hear from the Lord to write the first five books, but Moses saw Jesus and told us about him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.